This podcast contains adult language and stories of true crime. If you don't like laughing, crying, or being horrified at the actions of other humans, this podcast is not for you. Hello, listeners. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 19 of Resolve Mysteries. This is the show where we rewatch, recap, and give you the latest updates to cases featured on the show Unsolved Mysteries. And I'm Eliza. I'm Allison. And I'm Carlin. And welcome. We're happy you're here. As many of you know, for every review we receive, we donate a dollar to a different organization, and our patron, Beth H., recommended that we donate to St. Jude Children's Hospital this month, so that's what we're doing, and we're excited to do that. And if you'd like to suggest a nonprofit for us to donate to and also support us on Patreon, you'll get access to ad-free episodes, two additional episodes a month early access to listener short stacks and goodies in the mail. So go to patreon.com slash resolve mysteries podcast. And thank you again, Beth H for recommending St. Jude's. Okay. We're going to get right into it. It's just a three segment episode again, like last episode, a grab bag again. Oh boy. (laughs) Is it? And speaking of grab bags, what's your first segment, Carlin? Oh my gosh. It might involve the grabbing of bags. And it is actually the segment type is called robbery. And I don't think we've seen that before. No, I don't think so. It's usually like wanted or something like that. But it actually was robbery. And what kind of robbery is it? it? Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) And it is the Valley Bank robbery. But that name literally pertains to absolutely nothing that I'm going to tell you. (laughs) But I will say that the mask in the reenactment is horrifying. Oh, we have multiple horrifying masks. Mm -hmm. Hate it. And then I have a last love segment about Barney Dewey looking for his long lost sister, Angeline. And then I have a segment called An Unexplained Death, but like Carlin, it's not. It's a wanted segment, and we're looking for Cheryl Holland because she's a nightmare person, and we hate her so much. Truly. I was shocked endlessly every time something happened in this Do you remember the other night when you were like, I can't wait for you to watch the segment? (laughs) Oh, yeah. yeah. I was dead the whole time. I was dead. I was dead? I was like, what? I'm just, we'll just get to it. Let's get to it. Yeah, we've never seen a more heartless person. Let's get into it. All right, so robbery at the Valley Bank. Stack says, according to official FBI files on any given day, an estimated 40 banks in the United States are robbed at gunpoint. On November 13th, 1991, a bank in Henderson, Nevada was added to the list. It was a frightening and traumatic experience for the bank employees who, fearing retribution, have asked that their identities be concealed. So everybody be in shadow in this segment. Mm Mm-hmm. It began an hour before opening. A bank manager was at his desk alone, seemingly secure behind locked doors. So our reenactment begins, and a bank manager is sitting at his desk in view of the front doors. A man just walks in, and he's wearing a trench coat, and he's totally cramping Robert Stock's style. Hate it. He is also wearing a weird mask that looks like a face. Mm. Hate it. He's got aviator sunglasses and an Afro wig on. Mm -mm. So he essentially looks like a big, greasy man, and his mouth is not (laughs) moving as he speaks. So it's just the stuff of nightmares. It's horrible. It truly is. He's like the Beast of Jersey. Oh, yes. Oh. Right? Yes. Okay. And then there's another guy with a gun trailing behind him. He is also wearing a trench coat. And we don't really see until later in the segment, he's wearing this weird clear mask where just the mouth, nose, and eyebrows are colored in. Ew! Also horrifying. Mm. He's also wearing dark glasses and a baseball cap. So um, the guy busts in. He's pointing his gun at the manager, and he's like, don't touch the alarm. Did you set off the alarm? (laughs) And the manager, who has a very, like, fluffy mullet, says, no, he didn't set it off. And the guy says not to set it off and to do everything he says to do. So then he says, now, is there anything you have to do now? (laughs) Which is so weird. What? 
And the bank manager stays totally calm, and he's like, I need to sign on my computer and check my daily mail, (laughs) which I was very skeptical of there being email at this point in time. Same. So the bank manager is interviewed, and he says the very first thing he noticed was that they both had guns. The manager is interviewed in silhouette, and he says he thinks the individual was a professional bank robber because he knew about banking procedures. In the reenactment, the manager calmly walks him back to the desks, tells him to do, and the guy is like, just do what you have to do. <laughs> he's like, okay, well, I got to call the police. And- yeah, he's like, oh, I got an appointment. <laughs> That's something I must do. But he says that the man is definitely, like, watching to make sure he's not setting off a silent alarm somewhere. Yep. Um, so the guy knows what's up. And also is like, go on with your day so no one's like, this branch hasn't checked in with this mm-hmm. information. We better check yes. on them. Yeah. Yes, totally. So the manager logs onto his computer and the robber, the robber says, all right, now just stand there. And at this point <laughs> is when we see the mask up close. For some reason, the mouth is yellow. The skin uh-uh. is gray. It uh-uh. is just the fucking weirdest mask you've ever seen. Uh-huh. Nightmare fuel. At one point in the reenactment, the manager starts, like, looking at him. Like, he's like, what the fuck is this? And the guy's just like, don't look at me. (laughs) It's so weird. (laughs) Well, then you should have worn that mask. Yeah, you should not have worn this horrifying mask. (laughs) So Stack explains that the robbers knew that the bank had a dual combination lock, which meant that the manager knew the first half of the, the sequence to turn, and the teller knew the second half, which I did not know was a thing, and that's very smart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the teller arrives to the bank at 8 a.m. The robber runs out with his gun. He's, like, pushing the manager along. He tells the teller to open the vault. So she says they went to the inner vault where the cash was. The robber starts getting in the vault, and he tells the teller to go stand out by his partner in the lobby and tells the manager to stand by the vault door. So then, of course, more tellers are arriving to work. So as soon as they're coming in, the other gunman is, like, forcing them into the lobby at gunpoint. And guarding them. Um, At some point, the silent alarm was activated, which is all they tell us in UM. They don't tell us who did it. Like, uh, which is very odd. I thought was weird since the whole story was about how the guy was watching the whole time. So it's like you'd want to know how they snuck it. And like somebody was really sneaky and clever and they don't tell us who, which is weird. Maybe they're afraid. Oh, yeah, maybe. That's a good point. Yeah. So the police arrive and they park outside and they start staking out the bank. Sergeant Richard Perkins of the Henderson PD is interviewed, and he says, The robbery was very well planned out. We were able to make it to the bank, we believe, without their knowledge. He says, If the robbers had known they were on their way, they'd likely have left prior to them arriving to avoid confrontation. Mm. (laughs) I was like, Yeah, uh uh-huh. That's how bank robbery works. Yep. So once the officers were, quote, in position, the police dispatcher called the bank to see what was going on. So the phone rings, and the bank manager is like, I got to get the phone. And the robber's Mm -hmm. like, we'll get it. (laughs) Whereas he could have been like, don't fucking answer that. I will kill you if you answer that. But that's not what he does. So the dispatcher calls and says exactly what is going on. She's like, this is the police. Your alarm is going off. Is everything good? (laughs) So it just doesn't seem like the right protocol at all. Because what if the robber answered... What if the robber's listening while you answer? Yeah. Like, yes. this is not what, what they are you got doing? lucky. They just had a stupid robber. That's true. It should be like code word applesauce. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I was That's just so what annoyed our by the alarm has. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. So she says again, is everything okay there? And the bank manager doesn't know what to do because the guy is standing directly behind him while he's on the phone. So he goes, I suppose. Oh. <laughs> And the bank manager in silhouette in the interview says he was trying to figure out how to alert her that they needed help without the robber knowing. He says normally if he'd gotten this call, he would have been, quote, joyful and said everything is good. But in this case, he just said, yeah, I suppose everything's okay. Like he's trying to play it up like he was being so sneaky. (laughs) But he was Poor guy. so scared. He's really he was so scared. And there was no protocol in place for this. No. So he says, yeah, everything's fine. (laughs) So the robber is like, did you set off the alarm? (laughs) And the guy is like, no, I did not. (laughs) And the lady on the phone goes, who are you talking to? (laughs) Uh, 
<laughs> it's just like everyone is terrible at this. Everyone sucks at their job. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is bad at this. Then the manager says, there's someone else here with me, which somehow does yep. not tip yep. off the robber yep. as to what he's nope. talking about on it's the fine. phone. fine. Mm-hmm. So then the woman on the phone is like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to need you to go outside and talk with my officers. Can you do that for me? Get the officers the fuck in there. What are Why you would you not about? assume he's being held hostage? What is wrong with you? <laughs> so for some reason, <laughs> this is how she instructs him. So he gets smart, though, and he's like, Oh, it's the business across the street. They're calling. Yes. They think something's wrong. Like, I'm going to have to go out there and tell them nothing's wrong. So smart. Yeah. Which was very smart. That was some quick thinking. Love. So he goes outside, and he says that the hardest thing was that he was that he had to, like, walk by all his employees who were tied yeah. up. Oh, my God. He said, knowing that once he left the bank, he couldn't back get back in to do anything to help them. Yeah. Aww. He's nice. Which I, I was like... But you, quote, couldn't get back in because the police aren't going to let you go back in. But the police are outside. So by going outside, you are helping them. Like, yeah, you know. but I think he meant, like, just being personally responsible in that time in case something I'm happened. safe now and they're not. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So then the robbers decide they're going to leave and they're going to take one of the tellers hostage with them. Worst mm. case scenario. So they just pick one and they no. leave with her. And then, weirdly, the one in the clear mask is like, stop. <laughs> and Stack says, quote, for reasons known only to himself, yes. one of the holdup men removed his mask as he left the bank. Why? He literally, like, stops the whole process and is like, wait, wait, wait. I need to show my Takes face. Takes his mask off, leaves it in the bank. <laughs> it is bizarre. It's such an odd choice, and his partner is fine with it. Like, totally yeah. fine that he's burying his face as they leave with their hostage. <laughs> oh, my God. Again, everyone is terrible at this. So then they take their hostage. They jump in their car and speed off because apparently the cops were not at every entrance yeah, and exit to this to bank. Go. Where were they? How many places could you get in and out of a bank? <sighs> yeah. I feel like there should only None be two. None of this makes sense. <laughs> nope. So the cops just watch the guys speed off, and they start chasing them in their car. And then there's this very dramatic car chase scene. They're driving over medians and traffic cones and swerving around things. Mm -hmm. One of the robbers starts hanging out the window with a gun, shooting at them. That's crazy. So then they apparently did plan out their escape route well. They went into this very large apartment complex to try to confuse the police. Which is, you know, you can definitely get lost in one of those things. Yeah. Sergeant Perkins explains there's only three entrances and exits to the lot, and there's six to eight dead ends in it. So he's like, you know, the robbers knew exactly how to get out. Mm. Then they have the interview with the teller who's held hostage, and she's like, uh, well, I didn't want them to know that I could identify them, so I just closed my eyes and laid down. <laughs> Aww, it's very strange. Honey. She's really trying. Also, like, I don't. I don't want to see their face. Like, they're going to kill me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So police eventually seal off all the exits to the complex to hopefully trap them inside. But they just did not have enough cars to do that. So the guys just mm. drive around the car <sighs> and they're, like, shooting the guns, shooting at the police. Jeez. The guy in the a aviators and the Afro mask is just, like, hanging out the window like it's a crazy movie. Like Pretty Boy Floyd. <laughs> yes. It's wild. So they end up getting away, and Stack says that they switched getaway cars a while later so that they totally lost them. Wow. So, and then UM does not tell us how the teller got away. I'm guessing when they switched vehicles, they let her go or something, but they don't tell us. They don't give us an update on this poor girl. Weird. Stack tells us that authorities think the two men who committed the robbery may be responsible for as many as 10 holdups in the past five years. Wow. Stack says in each case, they successfully concealed their identities, leaving investigators absolutely nothing to go on. Hmm. Until they took their masks off, and then they didn't successfully. And they had everything That's what I to said. I was on. like, man, it was easy to rob a bank in the 80s. <laughs> yes, This it guy was. took his mask off while still in the bank, left the mask in the bank, and it's yeah, impossible fine. to identify him. Yep. Do you remember Fumbles? He would fall <laughs> down, and he still got to rob, like, seven banks in oh, Florida. Oh, poor Fumbles. He had a... 
Rough go. It was just so easy. So then Stack tells us the Henderson bank robbery would be different. That morning, a reporter named Catherine Scott heard the robbery happening on her police scanner. Love it. Love a police scanner queen. Mm -hmm. Love a queen that's just listening to her police scanner. Mm -hmm. Because we are also that queen. Mm -hmm. We are. So Catherine grabs her camera and the police scanner and jumps in the car. Oh, yes. She hears that there is a bank robbery, there are hostages, and the robbers have semi-automatic handguns, semi-automatic pistols. Mm. And they were heading her way on Sunset Road with the police behind them. So Catherine suddenly sees a car and she's like, that has to be them. Oh, my God. Quote, and that's when I thought I can take a picture. Catherine is risky as fuck, but she is a badass bitch. (laughs) She's amazing. She's amazing. She could not help herself. I love She was scared because if they saw her do it, there could be enough time for them to see her and shoot her. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is Catherine is about to pass the car. They are going in the opposite way in the lane next to her, like they're going to pass. So they're coming towards her, and Catherine says her heart started beating really fast, and she kept thinking, (sighs) quote, I can take this picture, but he'll shoot me. I can take this picture. I want to take this picture. I have to take this picture, but he'll shoot me. (laughs) Like, you know, when your mind, like, doesn't have time to even weigh the options and you're like, yeah, at some point, my body's going to involuntarily just pick something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's what happened. Yes. Yep. So in the reenactment, we see Catherine driving along. She does not turn her head. She keeps her head straight forward as they're passing the robbers. And then she just holds her hand up and snaps that picture right as they're passing by. Click. Love it. Oh, queen, queen, queen. So then they show the photo on UM, the actual photo that Catherine took, and it's pretty blurry. Um, They say that the authorities have enhanced it, but it's hard to see much detail, but you can sort of kind of get an idea of how this guy's face is shaped. You can definitely tell he has a big mustache. Like, there are some things we can pull from this. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if it had been, like, a second later that she clicked, she probably wouldn't have got his face at all. At all. Totally. Yep. The timing like, is It's insane. actually pretty good that it turned out as good as it did, even though it I was know. a bad photo. Totally. Yes. yes. That's the best it could have been in that scenario. Yes. And she didn't know what it was going to look like till she got it developed a few days later. Unless oh, she can spent you the money to go to a one-hour photo, honey? The stress. The stress. Oh, my God. Oh. So they make a composite based on this image, with the, which they show us. And it's one of the better composites we've seen for sure. But it is also totally made up. Based on the mere suggestion of a face. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm just like, I don't think we have any weight here with this composite. So they tell us that the suspect is a Caucasian or Hispanic man, which the composite fully looks Latino, like 100%. Uh, They say between 40 and 50 years old, 6 foot 2 and about 220 pounds. Then they say no photographs exist of the other robber without a mask. And then they show like a weird bank <laughs> surveillance photo where it looks like a really creepy woman wearing sunglasses. <laughs> it's like not good. Like, why are you even showing us this? <laughs> what is the point? Yeah. And they tell us his stats, um, late 30s, 5'9", around 175 pounds. Then we get an update screen. But I won't read it now because I'm going to tell you the whole damn story. Um, but so we excited. do learn that this update, um, in this update, that the two men have been identified, and they tell us some other stuff about them. So, um, okay, so let's talk about these guys. So the segment depicts them as both like carefully planned, but also really like bad and sloppy at what they're doing. Mm-hmm. In reality, they were really good at robbing. Huh. Really, <laughs> really, really good at robbing. So the authorities were correct in thinking that these men were responsible for some other bank robberies. In fact, they were responsible for many. Mm. The robbers became known as the trench coat robbers. Wow. They're wearing trenches in that reenactment, and they were wearing trenches in all their robberies. Okay. So their names were William Arthur Kirkpatrick and Ray Lewis Bowman. And as I said, they were very good at robbing. (laughs) They were both expert locksmiths. 
Cool. They always wore disguises. They always wore trench coats, which both made them recognizable. Like people started to mm-hmm. realize this is the same guys. This is the same guys. But it also covered up any distinguishable clothing they were wearing. Right. Mm-hmm. They would rotate out various hats, glasses, masks. Um, they said one of them would often wear white makeup, which is creepy. <sighs> one of them would often be listening to a police scanner in his ear. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they don't all do that. Well, I think, you know, even like having access to an earpiece yeah. maybe wasn't easy at that That's time. That's true. Mm-hmm. They would always go to banks either right before opening, like we saw in the segment, mm-hmm. or right after closing so that only the bank staff were there. Mm-hmm. Nice of them. They would pick the lock so that they would catch the staff off guard by just like walking in, in the lobby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They would often tie up tellers with zip ties, get access to the vaults, and be in and out swiftly. Wow. So here is what else they would do and why they were able to do this so many times without being caught. Tell me, tell me, tell me. They would spend a few months planning a heist before they'd, they would actually commit it. They would travel for the heist, so they would never mm. do one close to where they lived. So they would spend a few months planning together. Then they would travel to the to the state they were going to do the robbery in. Mm-hmm. They would spend a few weeks in town casing the bank. So they would know schedules, procedures, all of that. Mm-hmm. They'd often steal cars. Um, they also had a full set of skeleton keys that worked on all Chrysler vehicles. <laughs> so, like, they would just choose an area and, and be like, we can jump in any Chrysler. Whoa. They'd rob the bank, and then they would go home, usually to another state far away, so they were hard to track. But the biggest catch is they lived in different states, so it was really hard to connect them to each other. Oh, my God. They were, like, long distance. I love that. (laughs) They made it work. They made it work. They really did. Bowman lived in Kansas City, Missouri, and Kirkpatrick lived in Hovland, Minnesota. What? So once they'd complete a robbery, they'd go home to their respective states. Along the way, they would hide their money and their weapons and their disguises <gasps> in safety deposit boxes. Oh, I love it. So okay. like nothing was just all sitting in one place ready to be found. This is very smart. I know. It's like mm-hmm. I'm very mad about it, but I'm also <laughs> kind of like not mad about mm-hmm. it. And all of this worked again and again and again. Yeah. How'd they know each other? We'll get to that. Okay. I hope they were childhood best friends. <laughs> right. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So the government claims that from 1982 to 1997, the trench coat robbers stole more than $8 million across 28 <gasps> bank robberies. <laughs> Whoa. Yes. And $8 million in 1997 monies was $13,854,105. Holy shit. <laughs> Why didn't they stop? How much money did they need? Oh, my gosh. Well, they were they were spending it, too. <laughs> they were definitely, like, living a luxurious life. Damn. Uh, I want to know everything about this. What were their day jobs? Who were they? Will they be my friends? <laughs> they didn't have day jobs, baby. Uh, was see, that's how job. you get caught. This is what they were doing. The IRS was the one that convicted Al Capone. Don't mess with taxes. Always Mm -hmm. pay your taxes. Oh, yeah. No, they were not doing that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Don't give people a reason to look at Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I know. So, and, like, they had girlfriends over the years. And, like, each of them would would have, like, a room in their house or their apartment where the girlfriend was not allowed to look. And these girlfriends were just, like, Okay. Okay. Like, you keep buying stuff for me, and that's fine. Yeah. Right. So the robberies increased over the years as they got better at it. Um, I read that on average they were pulling two bank heists per year. Oh. So just a few that were listed out. There was one at a Hawkeye Bank and Trust Company in Des Moines, Iowa in 1987 that was $48,500. Michigan National Bank in May of 1992, $122,386. U.S. Bank in Portland, Oregon, February 1994, $233,026. What? National City Bank in Ohio, October 1994, $362,529. So, like, each one is more and more money. Mm-hmm. And this is a few years after the U.M. airing. Yes. They're still going. They don't care. Yes, they're still Ugh. going. 
So then they came to the very last heist the trench coat robbers would commit together. Mm. A little bit after closing time on the evening of February 10th, 1997, two men wearing trench coats, sunglasses, and FBI caps came to the door of Sea First Bank in Lakewood, Lakewood, Washington, which is just south of Tacoma. There were three tellers inside getting ready to lock up the vault for the night. Kirkpatrick, who was 57 at this time, and Bowman, who was 53, they had been casing the bank for most of January. They were apparently living in a motel. They were eating at nice restaurants every night. (laughs) They even attended a piano concert at the University of Washington during their stay. They are best friend They're doing it correctly. They're like having a good time. Yes. (laughs) Oh my God, I love that. So they watch the bank for weeks. They develop a getaway route. They knew from watching the bank that it had a lot of cash recently delivered because this bank was used to pay the soldiers at Fort Lewis base. Oh, yeah. Which was nearby, and it was almost payday. So, like, they knew this cash was coming in. Oh, they do their research. They really do. Just best friends, doing research, having nice dinners, going to shows. Doing robberies. Once a year. It's not a big deal. (laughs) So as usual, the two used a small prying tool to open the lock on the door and entered with guns drawn. They ordered the women to go into the vault where they tied their wrists with zip ties. They put money in duffel bags and had to use a cart to help move the money to their stolen Jeep Cherokee. They carried out a total of (gasps) $4,461,681, which weighed 335 pounds. Oh my God. So they ha- like, had to use a cart and like multiple bags to get it out. Yeah, they say that you don't realize how heavy money is. That's like that one heist episode at the airport. Yes, yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, it turns out a million dollars is really heavy. Mm-hmm. Try four and a half million. Four and a half million? This would be the largest armed robbery in the United States at the time. Wow. wow. These two guys. I know. <laughs> oh, man, I'm... Very disappointed in them, but I'm also sort of very much into this. I know, and it's, like, so funny that UM was like, this one robbery at Valley Bank. (laughs) And it's like, right. Update. These people are kings. Yes. But they must have not. I mean, a lot of these happened after that one. Totally. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know. Oh, my god. Yeah, I mean, they had done a few at that point for sure, like at least five before that. But they just were prolific afterwards. You know that yes. they were home watching UM with their wives and their kids. And then they just went out and they kept on doing Damn. it. Yes. yes. So um, as we know, this was their last robbery, which means they eventually did get caught, as we know from the UM update as well. As I mentioned, the money they took from Sea First Bank alone weighed 335 pounds. <laughs> So there was an issue here of being able to store all of the cash. Oh, my gosh. (gasps) So they had to put it all over the place. So they had various storage units and, like, lockers and all these things. Sometimes they kept money in their cars. Like, it was everywhere. So the same year they committed the biggest robbery in the United States history, uh, the men got a little bit careless. Uh Uh-oh. In May of 1997, Bowman forgot to pay the bill on two foot lockers that he had at a storage facility in Kansas City. (sighs) Their downfall. Yep. Uh. So he forgets to pay one bill on two foot lockers. Oh, come on, In Kansas City. So the manager of the storage facility has to open them up to clear them out and sell the contents. So inside, he finds guns, silencer parts, a bulletproof vest, a baseball cap with police on it, a police scanner, and an attached earpiece, books on disguises, and videos about picking locks. So the manager calls the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which sent an agent to examine the contents. The manager later identified Bowman as Charles Clark, which is the name he was using to rent the unit. Okay. But he identifies him from a photo montage that they show. Mm, mm. Around this time, Kirkpatrick was dating a woman named Myra Penny. Kirkpatrick had given Penny $180,000 in cash so that the two of them could have a log cabin built on Lake Superior, which is near where they lived. 
Dream. Dream, 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 dream. Not mad. So Penny, in individual paper lunch sacks, <gasps> is bringing this builder $180,000 in cash oh, to pay no. for this. No. Penny. So, of course, the builder is like, what the fuck? And reports the money to the IRS. No. What are you doing? Just take the money. Boo. He did for a while until, like, the entire thing was starting to be paid in cash. He was like, what's going on? So he reports it, and the IRS begins a money laundering investigation on Penny. Oh. Poor Penny. Yeah. Oh, I know. So Kirkpatrick tried to warn Bowman that the IRS was going to be looking into Penny. Yep. So he calls him, but he's not there at the time. So he's like, we got to move. So he starts, like, getting the shit that's in his house that could be incriminating and <laughs> like loading it all up. all of the money. <laughs> yes, there was tons of money, like other, oh you know, God. guns and things. So he starts packing all this up to go to one of his storage units in Las Vegas. Mm. So when Bowman finally returned the call, Kirkpatrick wasn't there, but Penny was there. And when she answered the phone, she said... Uncle Tom has been to the house. Oh, she's. <laughs> so Bowman also starts moving money around, getting things out of his place. At one point, he even visits his estranged brother that he hadn't talked to for years. He brings a shit ton of money to him and leaves it. He leaves uh. this money and he says, if anything happens to me, this is for my kids. Aw. Wow. He trusted his brother. Yeah, I guess. So when Kirkpatrick is driving back from the Vegas storage unit where he went to go stash stuff, Mm -hmm. he gets pulled over for driving seven miles over the speed limit. come on. Careless. Careless. What? Seven miles? Seven miles over the speed limit. (laughs) So he gives the officer a fake ID and apparently was acting very strangely. Oh, God. (laughs) Can't imagine why. Keep your cool. So the officer is like, mm. so he says, I'm going to search your vehicle. Fuck. Inside the vehicle, he found four pistols, ski masks, fake police badges, <laughs> fake mustaches, locksmith tools, and $1.8 million <gasps> in cash. Mm. <laughs> it's okay, sir. You can go. This isn't <laughs> suspicious at all. Have a nice day. (laughs) In one of the court sources I found, it also said in the car was notes with uh, just, they were just numbers. They weren't like depicting what the numbers were, but they ended up being Ray Bowman's P.O. box number and his zip code. And then $1,808,776 in cash, numerous credit cards in the name of Donald Wilson, Two police scanners with earpieces and a 10 code sheet, which uh, listed out police Mm, radio codes mm -hmm. and plastic electrical ties and fake mustaches. I would have burned all of the stuff except for the money. Like, why is he taking that on the road? You could just buy more. You're on the run. I love that he was planning for future robberies. He was like, we're definitely going to (laughs) still need these police badges. But you're on the run. You got to just put kerosene on everything. Take the money and go, go, go. I know. You don't need to keep your zip ties. They were being dumb. They didn't think the police were, like, on them. So Kirkpatrick, of course, gets arrested on suspicion of being a felon in possession of a firearm. (laughs) So he's arrested. And then Penny goes a few days later and shows up with $100,000 in cash to bail him out. (laughs) Oh, my God, Penny. Read the room, girl. So the authorities seize the money and also briefly jail Penny on suspicion of money laundering. Penny, you had your chance. I Take know. even $2,000 and get out. I know. <laughs> Hopelessly devoted. <laughs> so Penny ultimately confesses and tells the authorities what she knows and her involvement with Kirkpatrick. And she also tells them, I mean, what she knows, which is that Kirkpatrick is involved with, quote, Ray from Kansas City. So these guys were smart because they didn't tell their ladies everything. But, you know. Enough. (laughs) Yeah. So when authorities searched Penny and Kirkpatrick's cabin, Uh they found a photograph of Ray Bowman's family on the fridge. (laughs) Oh. Because they're best friends. They're best friends. Friends. They love each other so much. 
So this is like literally the physical evidence they have to connect the two men. Oh, oh wow. God. Wow. Wow. So after that, the authorities start looking into Bowman and he gets arrested after a search of his home. Oh, no. So by the time both men arrested, the statute of limitations had run out on many of their bank robberies. Wow. Okay, well. <laughs> yep. So there were only about five that they could actually still try to charge them for. So you can read a lot about that investigation and how they linked them to all of them. Like, you know, they're they're showing all these different bank staff's lineups and they're um, pulling up receipts from their purchases in these cities to, like, prove where they were at time. You know, it's it's a lot, but it's, we don't need to outline it all here. Um, so and then, like, some of the money they had found was still in the straps from the banks that it was from. So, like, these guys weren't tying up all the ends Damn. for sure. When you got that much money, how can you even keep track? How do you? Oh, I know. Truly. Truly. And then when it's all over the damn country. So Kirkpatrick initially was just being charged with the money laundering and one of the bank robberies in 1993 because, you know, you can't just immediately, like, pin everything on them. So Bowman's arrest actually was not based on any of the robberies, but on his possession of the gun silencer that he had in his Whoa. possession because wow. it was unregistered. Uh, so he ended up having to serve two and a half years for that. Charges against Kirkpatrick in the Lakewood robbery, which was the big, big, big one in Washington, uh -huh. were dropped in 1998 after a judge ruled that Kirkpatrick's car was illegally searched by the trooper that pulled him over. Oh, I was wondering about that. Yep. Oh. That guy did not, I, other than like, this guy is suspicious AF, he had no reason. You have to have more reason than that. Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, li I like it. So what he actually went to trial for was one of the bank robberies in 93, as well as the money laundering. Huh. So there were lots of in investigations into all the various crimes these guys did. Um, Bowman tried to fight it the whole time because he was like, you cannot prove that's me. Whoa. You can't prove that's me. There was no physical evidence. These guys didn't leave fingerprints. They weren't on any cameras. Like, Wow. Yeah, even his lawyer was like, you just can't prove that's him. <laughs> mm. Okay, so ultimately, Bowman did get sentenced to 24 years in prison. Um, Kirkpatrick was only sentenced to 15 because he actually confessed once he was arrested and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So they, they do tell us that in the UM update. Um, and Kirkpatrick served his time and has since been released. Bowman died in prison in 2011. Mm. So... Yeah, so if I'm doing the math right, he would have been released either this year or next year, but he passed away. Oh. So I couldn't really deep dive too much, but I did want to throw in a little bit about the background like you were asking about. Um, so I don't know how they met, but in the 70s, they started out robbing record stores together. They would steal records. Whoa. Not robbing them, sorry, stealing records out of these record stores and selling disco records for like a higher price was how they started the original ebay baby <laughs> gotta love the hustle yeah so they both had been in trouble with the law before i said i saw that kirkpatrick had been arrested for burglary um he had police records dating back to 1957 and bowman had a record dating back to 1962 and he had been arrested about eight times on things like suspicion of stealing money and stuff like that. But they had no felony charges or convictions before that. It was all, like, smaller crimes. So they started out stealing disco records. And ultimately, at the time of their arrest, they were the most prolific bank robbers in the U.S. Wow. Oh, my God. Listen, when two people meet and fall in love, <laughs> Kiss started it. from the bottom, now they're here. <laughs> Truly. <sighs> Truly. Um. So just update on Myra Penny. She did try to say she was not part of all the crimes. <laughs> um, but I found this in the transcripts from, at one point, Bowman had tried to appeal. And so this was transcripts from that. And this was from June of 2000. And it said, quote, there is no question that Penny was part of the conspiracy. She helped Kirkpatrick deposit proceeds by putting them in various bank accounts in her name. She cased a bank with Kirkpatrick. She paid the credit card bills that contained expenses for Bowman and Kirkpatrick. And at Kirkpatrick's request, she warned Bowman about the IRS subpoena. 
Almost all of Kirkpatrick's statements were made to keep Penny informed about what was going on and to enlist her help in conducting and covering up the operation. Penny! Yeah, she was very involved. So she did end up serving time as well. I, I couldn't find how much time, but she was in jail for a while. Penny was trying to get those pennies. Penny was trying to get that lake house, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> That's all she wanted was a cabin on the lake. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's it. I did try to wow. find Kirkpatrick because he was released. Um, yeah. I, I assume he's still alive, but I could not find him. There's a lot of people yeah. with his name, and I didn't find anybody that matched up. But Yeah. Wow. Wow, yeah. that was epic. What a ride. I know. I know. I never would have thought. I have to say that I don't rem- I don't know which name is which, but the composite that came from the photograph does look a lot like the guy that was arrested. They definitely had some of the face shapes right, like the nose, yes. and the mustache. Yep. Even though it came from that blurry picture. Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't ended terribly up far like off. him. Yeah. Great job. Oh <sighs> my god. We're glad no one got hurt. That's a good one when no one gets hurt. Yeah, Yeah. there was actually, I think that robbery that we see in UM is the only one where they actually drew guns on people. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Love. Great job. Nice work. That was a lot of fun. Okay. Here we go. As if we haven't had enough. Uh adults tricking children into being adopted or taken away from their parents. Here's another one. Oh, no. So at the time of this episode's airing, 62-year-old Stockton, California resident Barney Dewey, who in Stack's, I guess, California accent, calls Bonnie (laughs) every time. I don't understand why he's calling him Bonnie. 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 Bonnie is searching for his sister, Angeline, whom he lost contact with during the Great Depression. Oh, my God, right. And then we see a bunch of very sad black and white photos of very poor people during the Great Depression. And Stack kind of talks about how it lasted longer than, you know, just when we think of it starting. Like, it definitely bled into the 30s and 40s, and then it's wartime also, and not great times. So in 1941, he was 12 years old, and he started working part-time at a gas station in Abilene, Texas. And while he was working at, again, 12. 12, I was going to say, as you do, your first job. Oh, God. He would also watch over his sister, Angeline, who was younger than him. And so she'd just kind of be playing there while he was working. And the reason he was, they were sort of just watching out for each other is um, his stepfather was in the hospital and their mother was working long hours at a garment factory. Oh, my God. And the children playing the reenactors are like in very, you know, they're very dirty. Their hair is very messy. And we see the girl playing Angeline, playing with, like, an old doll and some rusty car wheel parts. Oh, my God. They really set the scene. Oh, Mm -hmm. God, they did. Um, And Barney says, times were rough in those days, and we were just concerned with living and trying to keep body and soul together. Mm. And my mother was trying real hard. She was not a well-educated person, and that was the only job that was available, meaning the garment work. Yeah factory of course this is before many workers rights and so she's probably is working constantly and has to or she'll get fired yep so then one day in the spring of 1941 they're at the gas station and a man named reverend nicholas visited them drives up in his car and he's he comes out and he, of his car and he has a cane and he seems so nice and friendly and he tells Barney that he's friends with their mother and that their mother had basically sent him to pick them up. Georgia Tan's brother, you mean, came in? Seriously. Basically. And does the man have candy? Of course he does. In his pocket? Yes. <sighs> so with the candy and with the reassurance that they're going to go see their mother and that this is what their mother wants, Barney is thinking, like, maybe she's sick or something, and this is why this is happening. So they go, they get in the car, and um, Reverend Nicholas, who he says, everybody calls me Daddy Nicholas. No, thank you. 
he takes the kids to a hotel and gives them new clothes and had professional photographs taken of them. Oh my god, if you're a kid, you're like, this is so cool. Yeah, it's like oh, an and they look situation. Like perfect angels in those pictures. Yes. You're so excited. You get new clothes. You're spiffed up. You think that the you're photo's clean. going to your mom. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's horrible. So then we get to see the photograph and they're adorable and they're like standing side by side. They're in the cutest clothes. And then I loved this. This is so sad, the whole segment, but I loved this detail. The wardrobe department recreated the clothes that the kids wore in the photograph for the reenactors to wear in the next scene. Oh, I didn't know that. And so that's what you see when you see them at the bus depot in the next scene. Which was cool. Like she's wearing the exact same like puffy cap sleeve shirt with the same collar and so they go to the bus depot and the reverend tells the kids that they're just going on a little trip and their mother's going to meet them there. And poor Angeline starts to cry and she's like, I don't want to get on the bus. I don't want to get on the bus. But the reverend reassures them that everything will be okay and their mother's going to see them. And Barney, as an adult, says every little worry we had, he had like an answer, an argument or a reason against it. Yeah. That he would reassure them every time. Mm -hmm. So they're put on a bus by themselves Mm -hmm. to go and they get taken to a foster home. And in the reenactment, it looks like other kids are there, too. And they're there for a few days until Reverend Nicholas and his adopted son, who's an adult, come and only take Barney. Mm. And they say, it's just, we're just going to go have lunch. We're just going to have lunch with him. And poor Angeline is crying. She has to be restrained by the people that work at the foster home. She knows. Yes, she knows exactly. Exactly. That's how I felt. She had intuition that this was not there. He's not telling the truth. Yeah. Aww. She was like, it was okay when you took us away, but now you're mm-hmm. taking him away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you promised my mom was going to be here and mm-hmm. she's not yet. Yeah. So I'm not really trusting you. And I'm hearing stories from other kids at this foster home, probably that they haven't seen their parents. in Oh a long my time. God. I didn't even think of that. That's so upsetting. Yes. Horrible. So that is the last time that Barney sees Angeline because Barney is taken conveniently to Reverend Nicholas's secretary's ranch because her and her husband need a ranch hand. Yeah. And so he goes to live there and he's basically working all the land. And so it is so very sad. Um However, we do have a bigger cow budget in this scene. <laughs> <laughs> and a bigger hay budget. Is this the most amount of cows and hays we've seen so far? Yes. The <laughs> most amount of hays for sure. All the hays, close ups of the hays being chewed, gratuitous cud chewing. <laughs> <laughs> so he really liked, he did, however, like, even though it clearly he's just enslaved by these people. He said that the foster parents were were nice to him, even though this guy lived, this poor little boy lived basically alone. He lived very far away from yes. the main house on the it land. Was so sad. Yep. Oh my God. So eventually he gets lonely and he's like, I liked doing the work. I was like in charge of the land. I was busy all day. I, I had my own horse. I got to do whatever I wanted. But oh so God. he's just has a good attitude about everything. He's so nice. Bless him. Um, but eventually he does become lonely because of obviously. And he decided he needed to do the right thing. And the right thing was to go and find his family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So he left the ranch with 37 cents in his pocket. That's such a classic grandpa story. Oh, my gosh. I know. So he hitchhiked to Haskell, and which is where his family had lived and realized that they had moved. So he was able to find his birth father in Cleburne, Texas, and they traveled together. So his birth father was not in the picture before. Like, the father we mentioned was the stepfather. He yeah. clearly didn't live with his birth father at all. The The fact that he was able even able to find anyone is unbelievable. Um, so his birth father and him traveled to Humble, and then from there his father put him on a bus to Odessa, and when he arrived there, he was reunited with his mother and stepfather. Oh, 
-hmm. And when he got to Odessa, he was able to recognize his mother right away, but she didn't recognize him at first because he had changed so much in the year that he'd been gone. Oh, my God. He asked his mom, he said, Mama, did you ever sign any papers that would have allowed us to be adopted? And she said, no, she would never do that. Mm. So Barney was able to stay with his parents uh, until he was 18, and then he got married in 1947. In 1951, he and his wife traveled to Abilene in an attempt to locate Angeline. Oh, right, the pharmacist. Yes, in Abilene, he was able to locate that adult adopted son that I mentioned earlier who event- who came with his father, the reverend, mm-hmm. to take Barney away. And that man's name was Nick Crane. And they asked around about him and they learned that he owned a pharmacy in town. So they went to the pharmacy and the I wish there had been a scene of confronting him for truly stealing him. Mm-hmm. But there wasn't, and all they do is just ask, like, we need to know, we want to know where your dad is so we can maybe find some records about where my sister was taken to. And his dad had died a couple years before, so he wasn't able to speak on it. Just terrible. Terrible. So, yeah, like Allison said, they went and all the records that were there were, like, not kept well at all, and the foster home like orphanage that the reverend had ran had been shut down um, by the state. So all the records that there were left were just like in dirty boxes behind the pharmacy. And Barney and his wife looked through them, um, but they found no trace of Angeline's name. And that was kind of like a dead end. They didn't know where to find her from there. Mm. So that is where the episode or the segment ends. Um, But as a result of the airing of this segment, a man named Neil Smith from Cedar Hills, Texas, was watching the broadcast and recognized Mm. his adopted sister, who he knew as Martha Jean Smith, Mm. as the little girl that Barney was calling Angeline. And so Barney doesn't say anything about this in the segment. I don't know if he just didn't realize or if it happened later. I don't know. But um, Martha Jean, who's Angeline, had an intellectual disability, and she lived and worked at a place called the Rainbow Ranch, which was a group, group home in Camp Verde, Arizona. And so a few weeks after the broadcast, on March 23rd, Barney who is so happy. I know. So it's happy. so nice. Oh, my God. He, um, like, they organized the reunion to take place at his daughter's home in Chandler, Arizona. And he's there. He has flowers for her. She dri- Someone's driving her. She drives up. She's in the passenger seat. He points at her in the nicest way when he sees her, just like a big brother. It's yep. so nice. It's the nicest. I always love these because I'm always like, gosh, do they wonder what each other look like? They look so old. They're old people Mm -hmm. now. And it's just like to them, they're still kids. Like that bond is from childhood kind of. They don't care what they look like. When she gets out, he gives her the biggest hug. Yeah. And then they're standing side by side. And he's like, this is how we was standing when we took that picture all those years ago before we got separated. (laughs) And he's like, my little sister. And... Oh, mm. it's so nice. He's and he's really happy honey. because he learns, you know, what the one of the things, of course, that you're always worried about is where they were adopted okay? into a good family. Yeah. And she had been treated really well by her adopted family and re- had received an education. And I don't know how the group home was, but I think that seemed to be an okay situation according to, you know, what the segment was saying yeah. or the update. Um, and she's really happy, too. She says she's so glad to have two families now, and she just keeps saying, I'm just so happy. He has a lot of pictures from his childhood, like pictures of their mother that he shows her, and they have an older sister that the segment doesn't mention that he shows her. So so because of UM, they got back together, and just a little update. Of course, they were he was older when this even aired. Yeah. So he passed away in 2019 at the age of 91. Wow. And I'll read a little bit of his obituary because I think it's very interesting. Hmm. 
It says that he was born to Lucy and Barney Dewey. He enlisted in the Army in May of 1946, so that was after, obviously, he was reunited with his family um, when he turned 18, and then the next year he got married, um, or two years later. But they didn't talk about him joining the Army. Mm -hmm. After leaving the Army, he returned home to Odessa and met his wife, Stella May, and they got married, and they were married for 71 years. (sighs) Oh. (sighs) They had five children, eight grandchildren, and nine great-grandchildren. Oh, my God. And he, even though the man that stole him away from his family and stole his sister from him was a a reverend or claimed to be, he did become a pastor. Mm. And he pastored three churches, and everyone that was, like, commenting on his obituary was like, he was the pastor of my parents' church. He was so loving. His wife was so loving, blah, blah, blah. He probably wanted to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a very loving person, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. (laughs) I'm going to cry. I know. (sighs) Um, and they called him Brother Dewey. So Brother Dewey has always been an exceptional role model. Many have looked up to him, and as a father and husband, we all look to him for support and protection. He sang songs of redemption redemption and hope. He laughed at life's trials and made all of us feel better. Words cannot describe how greatly he will be missed. Then Martha Jean, or Angeline, yeah. lived till she was 89, and she just passed away in August of this year. Oh, my what? God. Yes. And all that says, there wasn't like a photo with hers or anything, but all that says is Martha Jean Smith was born in 1931 in Abilene, Texas. Parents William Marvin and Nettie Gage Smith. So it names her adopted parents Mm. as her parents. That's interesting Mm -hmm. because she was younger. Uh Uh-huh. And then it just says she'll be deeply missed by her family and friends. But they both lived very long lives. Oh, my God. And I don't know if they stayed in contact at all, but I hope they did. And I'm sure they did. Very nice people. It's too nice. So that's it. They found each other. It's the best. Uh, Love it. Good job. We love it. We love a last love. We love. All right. The last segment of season four, episode 19, is an unexplained death segment. So, Stack intros the segment by saying the picturesque forests of the Appalachian Mountains are dotted with small, tranquil communities where everyone knows their neighbor and families take root for generations. Joe Harvey and his wife Maddie called T. For 35 years, the Harveys ran a combination convenience store and automobile repair shop in Lewis Chapel Mountain, Tennessee, just northwest of Chattanooga. It was the only place to buy gas or groceries for miles around, and it served as a gathering place for the community. Ed Harvey, Joe's brother, is interviewed, and he said that T likes to talk a lot. He says that Joe was quieter, but she was like the community newspaper. In other words... (laughs) He says they knew everybody, and if anybody needed help, they would help. They also knew everybody's business. She's the goss queen. (laughs) Come on. She's just behind that counter all day. People coming in. Yes. Ed Harvey says it was common knowledge that they kept cash receipts in the store. And Ed says that he asked them time and time again not to keep that kind of money around. He told them that they needed a bank account. Ugh. And he says that he even tried to get Joe a gun to put in the station, but Joe wouldn't even do that. And Ed Mm. says that Joe trusted people too much. Uh -uh. Stack says that Joe and Maddie were such a fixture that people in the town thought that they would be there forever. And then Uh came March the 4th, 1991. The local sheriff was called to the Harvey's house by a concerned neighbor because for the first time in memory, the store was not open at 9 a.m. on Monday morning. Sheriff Mm. Joe May says that he walked up the steps to the back door and the back door was unlocked, so he pushed it open. Stack says that inside of the house, it was completely gutted. And in the reenactment, the house looks bananas. It seems like it's been completely, like, burned from the inside. Yes. It's, I have, they give video footage. I have photos of it. Mm. Everything inside the house has been set on fire, but for some like weird miraculous reason, the house itself didn't burn down. 
Crazy. It's so it's so nuts. So um, Stack says that Joe and Maddie were nowhere to be found. Sheriff May says that when he saw the condition of inside of the house, he walked back onto the porch and he discovered some blood spots with hair fragments and quote flesh. Mm-hmm. Oh. And then, mm-hmm. oh my God, he's such a honey. He says that gave him a funny feeling that something had happened. Mm-hmm. <sighs> So Stack says that agents from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, or the TBI, arrived on the scene, and they show videotape of the house. Everything is burned and black, but the the fire never got out of the house, and we never really talk about that, and I don't know if that's something that happens. I think it is, which is crazy, but... So weird how you can pour yeah. a gallon of gasoline onto stuff, and, like, it never leaves the interior of the building. Hmm. Yeah. So Stack says the state investigators soon found a two-gallon gas can on the kitchen table. Bill Pope, one of the heroes of this story because he was with it through and through, is the district attorney. He says that investigators also found blood spots throughout the house and on the steps leading from the house. So he says the conclusion is obvious. The arson was set as an attempt to cover up the crimes that had been committed there. When investigators were informed that the Harveys kept large sums of money, the first reaction was that there had been a robbery. Ed Harvey says that he thought they might have been kidnapped. He thought maybe they went to the Smokies or something like that. So I guess Mm -hmm. that means he thinks maybe they were kidnapped and taken to the Smoky Mountains. Mm. But when he got to the mountain... I guess there's a lot of mountains. I don't, they keep referring to the mountain, but also the Smoky Mountains. He found out that they had found blood and the house had been burned inside. And he says he didn't know what to think at that point. And all he could do was hope that they were still alive. Stack says that a large scale search in the area yielded absolutely nothing. The disappearance of Joe and Maddie Harvey left their family and friends stunned. That sort of thing just did not happen in Lewis Chapel Mountain. But soon the community would be rocked again. Another member of the Harvey family would mysteriously vanish. Oh. And at that point, I paused, I looked at the player. <laughs> And I was like, is this a mystery? (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yes. Am I the victim of a two mystery segment? Okay. So, Stack says that Joe and Maddie never had children, but they were extremely close to their extended family, especially their niece, 27-year-old Cheryl Holland, and her young daughter, who we never, ever learn the name of, which is Mm -hmm. good. Not good for me for later, but good for her for always. (laughs) Ed says that T could not have loved Cheryl any more if she had been her own daughter. She also oh, felt the same gosh. way about Cheryl's little girl. Ed says that T loved that little girl to death. Hmm. <sighs> I, mm, I'm so mad. Okay. Yeah. After watching this, I was just like, you know what? Everything's terrible. N- yep. No one deserves nice things. No. Stack says that one week after Joe and Maddie went missing, Cheryl's truck was found abandoned at a truck stop two hours away from home. Bill Pope says investigators found the truck unlocked. They found keys in the truck. They found a necklace of Cheryl's on the ground beside the truck. And her purse was still in the truck. And he says, based on the scene, it was reasonable to believe that there had been an abduction. To which I was like, I can't believe all these bad things are, are happening to this family. Yeah. I cannot yeah. believe this. To wit, my grandpa was a detective. He never believed in coincidences. I immediately mm. was like, no, no, no. Well, I was just like, someone is out to get this family. Mm-mm. Someone is attacking them. <laughs> yeah, no. I was like, what did Cheryl do? Mm. So um, Stack says that TBI agents... <laughs> Soon questions Cheryl's common law husband, Eddie Wooten. God, this guy. <laughs> Wooten says that Cheryl took him to Newport News, Virginia. He says they stopped at a place where they slept, but he can't remember where they stopped. Pope says that they have two missing people. Now they have three, all out of a very close immediate family. Pope says, then the question is, is she really missing? Is she an abductee Mm -hmm. or is she part and parcel of a crime? Mm -hmm. To which I was like, are you fucking kidding? This poor woman was abducted. KB. She had you. She had me. So... 
Bill Rutledge, Ed Harvey's brother-in-law. <laughs> Welcome to this like small community. Everybody is truly related. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Bill Rutledge says that Cheryl was a Christian girl living a Christian life, and there's no way that she was involved in this. I mean, this woman was a mother figure to her. Ha. <laughs> That's terrible. And people need to be a little more skeptical. A little bit. Mm, namely me. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> yeah, you're usually You know what's funny? Skeptic. You're usually the know, meanest. I don't know what's wrong. I just can't. <laughs> what happened to you? This woman cared for your child and loved her. Okay. <laughs> so Stack says that on March 10th, 1991, Eddie Wooten was questioned. He told authorities that in late February, he took Cheryl to a hospital in Knoxville for a week-long treatment of stomach cancer. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> because you can't treat stomach cancer in a week. Just, Just a week. A week. Mm -hmm. Even more weird, Eddie said he couldn't remember the name of the hospital they went to. Oh, boy. Mm. Pope says that the family told authorities that Cheryl had borrowed money and gone to other institutions for supposed treatment of a cancerous condition, and mm. they found that not to be true. Ooh. Mm. On the day in question that Eddie claimed that he left Cheryl in Knoxville for treatments, she was in fact working in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Sack says that finally Eddie Wooten broke down and a tale of heartless betrayal began to unravel. <sighs> In all, Wooten would tell the story three different times. He said that whole week, Cheryl worked at the truck stop and he stayed at home. So the whole week before the murder. Eddie said that on Saturday, March 2nd, Cheryl came home from work and she started telling Eddie that she needed more money. Where is this money going? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, what are the needs here? Yeah. Eddie said that that night they were going to go to Cheryl's mother's so that she could pick up a paycheck. Pope says that on the day in question, toward the evening hours, Eddie and Cheryl stopped by a gas station, purchased a gas can, and filled it up with gasoline. <sighs> Pope says then they went up to the mountain to talk to Cheryl's mother and then drove to the residence of Maddie and Joe Harvey. According to Wooten, he and Cheryl had their kids with them. Yep. I cannot. She's just the worst person. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was Truly. all Eddie. <laughs> I was like, Eddie's making this up. Oh, my all God. All of this is <laughs> so oh funny. Gosh, Carlin. Carlin coming in from a total That's different angle. So Eddie seemed guilty. Hey, uh, he just seemed dumb to me. He just did whatever she said. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. No, well, no, no, no. I thought he was lying and saying, like, she said to mm. do this, and, she, and it was all yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So... They left their kids in the truck. Cheryl and Eddie go in. Eddie claims that he said, I don't want to kill Joe and T, but Cheryl said that he had to help her do it. So who knows? They probably both went in there. They probably both. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. it was them planning yeah. it together, but I thought it was Eddie blaming her. Yeah. When, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think they're both pieces of shit. Like, I think it's yes. safe to say. Yes. Eddie says that he shot Joe while he was sitting on the couch, and then when Maddie came out of the back bedroom, he shot her in the head. Mm. Cheryl told Eddie to go to the driveway and tell the kids to get down onto the floorboard of the truck. Mm. One of their children is five, and the other is, like, six weeks old. Five. Five. Yes. yes. Plenty oh. old enough to witness all of this and be traumatized. Yes. Mm. According to Wooten, he and Cheryl put the bodies of Joe and Maddie in the trunk of their own car. Next, Wooten followed Cheryl as she drove across to the Alabama state line. They stopped at the Bridgeport Ferry on the Tennessee River and put the car into the river. Jeez. And then she just stands there and watch it watches it sink. sink. The fucking disregard for someone who was family to you. It is insane. Scary. Scary. So, um, according to Wooten, Cheryl then returned to Joe and Maddie's house and stole an estimated $150,000 in cash. Mm. And then she set fire to cover up the crime. And that is over $300,000 today. Oh, my God. Uh, $300,000. I know. Apparently did not have a bank account, like you said. Oh, Yeah. That's what we call a Blue Mountain Bank account, honey. Oh. 
I literally Googled, do Southern people hate banks? Like, what's going on? <laughs> I think a lot of them do. Um, so two days later, uh, and this is everything about this, Cheryl, like a true psychopath, returned to the crime scene. Even as the investigators were searching for evidence, she is standing there, and they believe that as she was standing there, the um, investigators brought out this gas can, and a big deal was made of it because there was a bloody <laughs> fingerprint at the bottom of it. Mm. Meanwhile, the entire town is standing the whole and watching town. it all unravel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Like they are witnessing the discovery of each piece of evidence. <laughs> So Pope says that Cheryl obviously intended for the house to burn completely, and the house didn't burn, and as a result, the gas can was left intact on the kitchen table. Lo and behold, that bloody fingerprint was left on the bottom of the gas can. And you're going to find this surprising, but it matched Cheryl Holland. Shocking. Genuine surprise. Gasping. Gasping. was. (laughs) This is the point. I love this. So much. This must have been fun for you. It was. That's why last night when I was like, you haven't watched it yet? I was just surprised all the time. (laughs) Well, so I'm sorry to disappoint you, Carlin, but maybe Cheryl Holland was not living such a good Christian life after all, (laughs) you know? Your hero. You know, never meet your heroes. (laughs) Never meet your heroes. I was like, they planted her finger. Oh, oh my, my God. God. This is a making a murderer situation. <laughs> Truly. Have you had like a little bit of an emotionally complicated week? You're coming on the tail end or something? You okay? <laughs> Anything you want to talk about offline? Because it was very clearly a Cheryl from the beginning. So, but like you, Anna Holland, Cheryl's sister, says that she was really hurt because she wouldn't believe that she she couldn't believe that she would do anything like that. Not at all. Mm-mm. Cheryl would not have had it in her. Stack says on a Wednesday, April 17th, searchers found the Harvey's car in the Tennessee River. Joe and Maddie had both been shot in the head, just as Eddie Wooten described. Sheriff mm. May says the hardest part, oh my God, this like broke my heart. Was He says it, the hardest part was identifying the bodies. Mm. He said that it was a bad thing to see them. Quote, the way that he had always seen them at the store and then to see them in the trunk of the car. Oh, my gosh. It was bad. Really bad. That's That's horrible. Yeah. I always think about that with these small town cases. Like the person you find is someone you know very well that you see all the time that you're close to. Stack says that Eddie Wooten was arraigned on charges of first degree murder and a warrant was immediately issued for Cheryl Holland's arrest on the same charges. Investigators began to track her movements in the day just after the killings. She seemed to be traveling alone, having left her children with her mother. But authorities soon learned of a mysterious man who had apparently been following her. On March 7th at 9.30 p.m., five days after the murders, Cheryl was seen by a service station attendant in Greenville, Tennessee. In the reenactment, she walks into the station. The woman asks, can I help you? Cheryl says, I was going to get gas, but I have to go. And she immediately runs out and goes to her car. And then the attendant says that she was seen talking to a man with the beard in a black leather jacket driving a red and white pickup truck. The attendant says that she didn't seem like she wanted to talk to the man, and she left the station, and the man followed right behind her in the same direction. Ugh. Stack says about an hour later, Cheryl was spotted using a payphone at a truck stop, 12 miles from the service station. She called her family and said that she was two hours from home. Later, another witness spotted two people talking inside of Cheryl's pickup truck. The man matching the description of the man seen at the service station following Cheryl was at Cheryl's work the day before the murders, and she was seen writing him a check. Hmm. She owed him money? <laughs> Pope says that whether or not it is the same man, they have no evidence to conclude that this man was involved at all. Cheryl was last seen at the truck stop at around 11.30 p.m. the same evening. Pope says he doesn't know if she planned this disappearance in advance or if it was an impulsive decision, but he believes that she is alive and has assumed a new identity somewhere. Anna, (laughs) Anna, Cheryl's (laughs) sister, says she doesn't think they're giving Cheryl the benefit of the doubt as much as she would like. Do you feel attacked, Carlin? Sorry, Carlin. But at this (laughs) point, I hope you are fully on board. (laughs) 
piano at this point. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> yes. Thank you for she joining us. She betrayed me. <laughs> I Just as she betrayed her. Anna. I mean, <laughs> it's a real form of evil. Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, it's Anna has terrible. a bit of a blind spot for Cheryl. Mm-hmm. Anna says that if Cheryl burned the house, it was only to get away from Eddie, which oh, oh my God. logic yes. doesn't. You know, the old defense mechanism <laughs> yes. of burning down someone else's house. He made me kill my parents, so I'm going to set their house on fire, burn all the evidence to get away from him. Yeah. Mm. Also, if it was Eddie, why doesn't Eddie have $150,000 anywhere? I feel like, as we were just talking about earlier True. in the episode, it's hard to hide that weighty money. True. Mm-hmm. Bill Rutledge says that Eddie wasn't educated. He claims that since Eddie had only been with Cheryl for a year or so, he wouldn't have known that Maddie and Joe had that kind of money in the house. But if Cheryl was constantly bitching about how she needed money, I'm sure she was also bitching about her aunt and uncle who just had money lying around. You know, like, so Eddie, no. I don't think, and no one is innocent between Eddie and Cheryl. They're both Mm -hmm. not good people. Yes. Stack wraps it up. He says a year has passed since the murders of Maddie and Joe Harvey, but a number of questions remain. Did Cheryl mastermind the murders? If so, what could drive a woman to kill the aunt and uncle who loved her so much besides $150,000 in 1991? Mm. Did Cheryl stage her disappearance or did she fall victim to an unknown assailant? Perhaps the bearded man. He Mm -hmm. says that no one will know exactly what transpired on the night of the murders until Cheryl Holland is found. Authorities believe that she is still alive and has fled Tennessee. And then we get a mother trucking update. Oh, we sure do. Uh, It was one of, like, my favorite. Austin, Texas, less than an hour after the broadcast, Cheryl Holland was arrested. That's fast. Fast. Real fast. Holland was arrested at the convenience store where she'd been working for six months under the assumed name of Amy Forrester. Employees Mm. of the store were shocked to learn of their co-worker's double life. Four days later, Cheryl Holland was returned to Tennessee to face charges of first-degree murder. A bye, bitch. Mm -hmm. Cheryl Holland and Edward Wooten were each convicted on two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. And that was a 20-minute segment. Filled with oh all my God. sorts of smoky mountain crazy. Uh, uh. Okay, so we got an amazing update. This is going to be really quick. So like they said in the segment, people couldn't believe that Amy Forrester was a stone-cold killer. I mean, can you imagine finding that out about your coworker? No. 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 Jesus. But here's the thing. The police chief, Roger Dean, is on record as saying, we knew her as Amy. She was always a friendly person. We only have two gas stations in town, so we frequented there a lot. <laughs> she loves us. Imagine town. being a coworker, but also being the police chief and this murderous person God. has been giving you, like, lukewarm coffee for the last six months. Yeah. And then her manager, Shapadani, said, I was real surprised. I couldn't believe she would hurt anybody. She was one of the most dependable, honest employees I ever had. I've even gotten calls from people who liked her a lot. Oh, oh my. What? I know. You need to get some better employees. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Eddie Wooten appealed, obviously, which is pretty usual for someone who gets two life sentences. He claimed a bunch of stuff, ineffective counsel, his confession not being legally obtained. Most notably, he claimed that his counsel was ineffective for failing to have his mental competency evaluated. What? But I don't think being stupid is a mental defect, so. No, no, no. Why would he want that? Unless he's going to plead not guilty He's by like, reason maybe of maybe they'll find out how dumb I am. Yeah. Right. He claimed that he was on medication. He was heavily oh. medicated. But they were like, you didn't say that when we arrested you. And we went mm-hmm. through your medical records and you were not heavily medicated. Oh, so then maybe please. you were self-medicating, but that's also not a defense. So nope. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Nope. And then he also said that there wasn't enough evidence to convict him, even though <laughs> He admitted to procuring the gun for the murders, accompanying Cheryl to the Harvey residence, shooting Joe Harvey. Yeah. (laughs) And he also admitted to assisting Cheryl with disposal of the bodies. So with his fucking children sitting outside in the car. You're right, Eddie. There's no DNA. I don't know what you're looking for. Unsurprisingly, we don't know much about Cheryl Holland's 
we don't have any court transcripts of her because she pled guilty. But mm. she contended that she didn't kill her aunt and uncle, and she did not drive the car. She only admitted to trying to burn the house down. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, the last thing is that I was able to find photos of Eddie and Cheryl because, thankfully, they're still incarcerated. Hmm. They were first eligible for parole in 2016, but they didn't get it, and they didn't get it again, they didn't get it again, and now we're good until 2025. Um, Cheryl, in her photo, looks like a little grandma that would poison your cupcake. Oh. <laughs> and Eddie looks like he's seen some shit. Oh, no. He looks like a Walking Dead extra. Ew. Yeah. Ooh. So that was really all I could find. But, like, I want to know, A, why did yes. Cheryl need the money? Yes. B, yes. how did she blow through $150,000 in six months, so much so that she had to get a job at a service station? Yes. Oh, yeah. Where's the money, Lebowski? I don't get it. I don't either. Yeah. I don't get it. Even if she owed somebody a lot of money, like a loan shark or something like that, what did she do to get herself in the right. hole? Right. There is nothing out there that says that either of them used a ton of drugs. There's nothing. And and in the reenactment, she is like, you know we need the money. We need it. And so it makes it sound like they can't eat and feed their children or something. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, people were like, well, maybe she just needed the money. They were uneducated. They were both working these shitty jobs. Yeah, okay. But yeah. then why don't you go to your aunt and uncle and say... Who love you. <sighs> yep, that's the other thing I was thinking. But then other people were like, well, maybe she had done that a few times. She lied. She said she had cancer. Mm. Right. Maybe Joe and Maddie were like, Cheryl, stop. We're not giving you any more money. Yeah. I think they might have cut her off. Yeah. And that's when she was like, you know we need this money. Yep. We got to kill them. They're not going to give it up. Oh, oh my God. That is so scary. But I fully thought they were talking about like $5,000. $150,000? Yes. What the fuck? They lived in like a single wide trailer. The house was so small. <laughs> Where'd the money even go? I don't know. Yeah, where did they keep it? I have so many questions. And because she pled guilty, there's no like – she doesn't have to – give any kind of additional information. We're never going to know. Yeah. No. Uh, of all the crimes. I hate it. Terrible. That's where we started. I know. The people who are fucking closest. What the fuck? That's very sad. Terrible. I can't even believe it still. Mm. She's just not a good person. No, nope. She's no. a dick bitch. She sure is. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything to share or feel. I'm boring. Oh, no. Isn't that sad? Yeah, it makes me feel sad for you because I know that you <laughs> like new stuff. I like stuff, and I just don't do any stuff anymore. I know. I'm sorry. <gasps> all the same pods, you know, all the same. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, when you told me that you listened to your pods, like, on Double Street, I was like, how does she have so many pods to listen to? I just run out of pods all the time. I, I have never run do. out of pods. I have pods that I love that I can't listen to because there's not enough time in the world. Well, you also have a different job than I have. Yeah, right? I Like, know. I sit by myself for, like, 16 hours a day. Yeah. So. And I have a fairly long commute. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, well, so I have a pod, speaking of pods, and I think you guys will really like it. Um, the show is called Harsh Reality, the story of Miriam Rivera. Oh, yeah, and what is that? I've been seeing this. It's by Wondery, but I'm, I'm, I apologize. It's, they work with another production company that works specifically with, uh, like, the trans community. Mm. But I guess apparently during, like, the height of reality TV and, like, Big Brother and stuff, a UK production company – did a reality dating show where the woman was trans and they didn't tell all of the bros until mm. the big reveal at the mm. last episode. Oh, gosh. So it's just a lot of conversation about, like, trans representation in entertainment and it's really, really good. It's, I think, six parts and, yeah, I really recommend it. Nice. That's great. Cool. Well, I don't have a fully developed share because it's only one episode that I've watched, but I did want to mention that I started watching The Shrink Next Door, oh, which is the mm. television series based on the podcast yes. we all loved. 
How is it? is it? We have our cast is Will Farrell as Marty, Paul Rudd as Hirschkopf, Catherine Hahn as Phyllis. Ah! Starting out great. I don't really know how I feel about it yet because I haven't watched enough, but I'm going to watch it all. Oh, and Will Ferrell is horrible at the accent, and Paul Rudd is great at it. Oh, no. <laughs> Where are they? Long Island? Uh, uh, is it Long Island? It's New York. I don't remember. Yeah. Well, they're I heard... in various places, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I heard them interviewed by the... Like, on the Shriek Next Door podcast feed, Paul oh, Rudd and Will Ferrell are interviewed by the podcast creator. Nice. That's awesome. As we all know, Paul Rudd is my number one celeb crush, so. Aww. Oh, I did not know that. I, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> wow. I feel like if you have sex with Paul Rudd, you two never age. <laughs> He's a fat Yeah, what is happening with that? I man? have no idea. A penis of youth. <laughs> a penis of okay. youth. <laughs> she really does love him. <laughs> <laughs> so cute it. how can you not love him oh my gosh i did not know you loved him so much great do you want to read the review uh yes i do and <laughs> it is this the subject is currently binging this is from Lindsay higgins My only complaint is I came upon this too late in life, and now I'm simultaneously trying to binge every ep, dip into all the recommendations for other podcasts, books, shows, etc. that are suggested, and trying to wash my hair like twice a week. (laughs) Keep it up, ladies. That's a lot going on. Yeah, we have the same We understand. We understand. That was adorably written. Okay, thanks, Lindsay. You too can leave us a review. We might read it on the show. And you also help us donate to different organizations each month. So thank you. Yes. Okay, Carlin. Okay, so next next week we've got a wanted segment about Richard Minns. And I have a Lost Heirs segment. We haven't had a Lost Heirs in quite some time. Mm -hmm. Catherine Bennett. Okay, we love you. And we will see you next week. We love you so. Goodbye. Bye. Go to patreon.com slash resolve mysteries podcast if you're interested in supporting us there. If you subscribe at the $5 a month level or higher, you're going to get ad free episodes, two extra episodes a month, and other goodies in the mail. To see photos we reference in the episode, follow us on Instagram at resolve mysteries podcast and on Facebook and Twitter at resolve the pod. You can contact us at resolve mysteries podcast.com, resolve mysteries podcast at gmail.com. Or at our P.O. Box, 14005, Portland, Oregon, 97293. Send us your stories for listener short stack episodes. If you want to email us your favorite unsolved mystery story or cold case or any nostalgia you have surrounding the show, send it our way because we love to hear from you. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like us, leave a five-star review and tell a friend or tell two or tell three. Don't forget, for every review we receive, we donate a dollar to a different nonprofit. My captions said teak with a K. It's T with an H. Oh. oh. Right? Did you do you watch it with captions? I didn't, I didn't watch only yours because with I watched it on 1.25 this time. Oh, you can still watch it with captions. It's oh, I, yeah, that I makes sense. I guess you probably my can. segment with captions. Oh, okay. Well, so cool. So I also had a segment <laughs> and um her name is T. <laughs> So, I don't need to. I don't need it. So, <laughs> so eat my butt. And thanks so much for paying attention to my segment, guys. Best friends forever. Okay. I paid attention. I just don't have to read it. Your spelling is your responsibility. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. All right. Sure, hey, Megan, it. thanks for that cider. All right. <laughs> All right. So.